Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight for the second Telephone Town Hall about healthcare services in our region. I would like to welcome you. My name is Harjot Guman Mataru, and I will be your moderator this evening. I was born and raised in this area, still live in the community, and I'm very pleased to be helping out this evening in support of our local health care organization. When I'm not moonlighting as a call moderator, I can be found co-hosting a radio show with my mother on Sulkari Radio, CJMR 1320M, on a Punjabi radio station in Toronto. My family, like everyone else in this community, accesses local health care services at one time or another. Tonight, we are here with five local health care leaders to talk about our local health care system, how our local health care system works and how to access the services which are most important to you and your family. Over the course of the next 45 minutes, we will hear from Scott McLeod, Chief Executive Officer of the Central West Local Health Integration Network, or LIN for short, Kathy Hasimovich, CEO of the Central West Community Care Access Center, Matthew Anderson, President and CEO of William Osler Health System, Liz Booth, President and CEO of Headwaters Health Care Center, and Jeanette Smith, Commissioner of Health Services for the Region of Peel. This is our area's second telephone townhouse to talk about those health care issues that are important to the community. Tonight, each health leader will speak for a couple of minutes. However, the main objective this evening is to take your questions and hear your comments. There will be a number of opportunities to ask questions throughout the telephone town hall. To be placed in the queue to ask a question, simply dial star 3 on your phone at any time. We are certainly going to try to answer as many of your questions as we can this evening. For those we cannot get to, you can stay on the line after the call and leave a voicemail message. Calls will be returned to you within 48 hours. The host organizations We'll also be posting answers to some of our frequently asked questions during tonight's call. These responses will be available on the organization's website within the next week. For those of you just joining us, welcome to a discussion about how you can be better served by a local health care system. Scott McLeod, CEO of the Central West Lynn, will begin this evening with some information about his organization and its priorities for health care in this area over the next three years. Thank you, Harjot. I'm pleased to be here with my colleagues from some of the key health service providers in Central West. The Central West Lynn is one of 14 LINs in Ontario responsible for planning, integrating, funding, and monitoring local health care services to meet the needs of our growing and diverse communities of Brampton, Caledon, Dufferin County, Malton, Rexdale, and Woodbridge. We work closely with the health service providers to improve access to local health care services for residents in these communities. In 2013, our total funding to 53 health service providers, including the CCAC, Community Care Access Center, Community Health Centers, Mental Health and Addiction Services, Community Support Service Organizations, Long-Term Care Homes and Hospitals was approximately $830 million. Earlier this year, we launched the third Integrated Health Services Plan, which is our strategic plan that was developed through input from residents and providers about the priorities in the local health care services. We have four strategic directions in the plan, and in no particular order, the first one is to drive quality and value by working with our health service providers to improve quality of health care services for residents. The second direction is to improve access to care for residents, which includes ensuring residents have access to primary care physicians, self-management and education programs for diabetes and chronic diseases, mental health and addiction services, and senior services. The third direction is to streamline transitions and navigation of the system, which will improve the patient journey from one health service provider to the next, using information technology to streamline services. And for some that may have heard of a new initiative called HealthLinks, it's really uh, targeted at that uh, particular direction. The fourth direction outlines the actions that we'll take over the, over the years to continue to build on the momentum that we've developed over the last seven years. 
Our strategic plan in these four directions are aligned with the Minister's Action Plan and are co collectively aimed at achieving health change to help ensure right services are available at the right time in the right place. And for more information, you can certainly check out our website at uh, www.centralwestlin, all one word, dot on dot ca. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. At this time, I'd like to open the floor to our callers. For those who have just joined the telephone town hall, if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment, press star 3 on your phone. This will bring you into the question queue to speak to the leaders of our participating health care organizations. We kindly ask that you keep your questions brief so that we can get to as many as possible tonight. At this moment, I would like to introduce um, Kathy Simovich, CEO of the Central West Community Care Access Centre. Thank you, Harjot. The Community Care Access Centre, or CCACs, exists to help people stay safe and independent at home for as long as possible. Our care coordinators are health care professionals who can help you to get the care you need. This may include in-home care, such as nursing, physiotherapy, personal support, and other services, or we can help you navigate the services in your community. When independent living is no longer possible, we can also arrange for options such as long-term care or supportive housing. As a CCAC, we work closely with our partners, including those partners on this call, to help people avoid the emergency department wherever possible and to return safely home should they require a visit to the hospital. Working more closely with family doctors and nurse practitioners is also a big priority for us. By working with your family doctor, we can develop even better care plans that link the care your doctor provides with in-home and community services provided through the CCAC and other community providers, giving you more effective and seamless care. CCAC services and advice are covered by OHIP. We often tell people that if you need help but don't know where to start, start with the CCAC. Simply call 310 CCAC, it's a free call, no area code is required, we're here to help. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, at this opportunity, we'd like to open up for questions for poll. Um, we have a polling question for those who are on the line at our telephone town hall today. And so now we'd like to ask you a question. To answer each question, please push the number on the phone that corresponds best with the options given to you. So the first polling question, is there a specific health care topic that you would like to discuss for a future telephone town hall? Test one, if you think, primary health care. Two, for mental health and addiction services. Three, for senior services. Four, for chronic diseases and diabetes services. If you'd like to ask a question or make a comment, press star 3 on your phone to get your question into a queue to be answered by a panel of health care leaders. At this time, we'd like to open the floor to our callers, and we'd like to now speak with Agnes. So we have a caller on the line. Um, we're going to speak with Agnes, and uh, she'd like to talk about wait times in our health care system. Agnes, you're with us now. And your question will be directed towards Matt Anderson. Hello, Agnes? Okay, so uh, while we wait for Agnes to come on to the call with us to talk to Matt about um, wait times in our health care services, uh, I'd like to introduce um, Matt, Matthew Anderson from William Osler Health System. Um, Matthew will be speaking to us about Will Osler's new five-year strategic plan and what it will mean for health care in this community. Great, thank you very much. Uh, looking forward to getting that call in about our wait times, as uh, wait times for all across the healthcare system are an important issue for us for sure. Um, 
We're very pleased with the opportunity to uh, spend some time with everyone uh, this evening. Um, if you don't know the William Oster Health System uh, very well, uh, Oster is comprised of three uh, hospital campuses, Etobicoke General Hospital, the Branson Civic Hospital, uh, and the soon to be redeveloped Peel Memorial Center. Uh, it's a very exciting time for healthcare uh, in our region. Um, we cover uh, Malton, Rexdale, up into Bolton and Woodbridge, uh, throughout Grantham, of course, and up into Caledon. Very busy place, very, very busy uh, organizations. Uh, next month, we'll be publicly launching our new five-year corporate strategic plan. Uh, this marks the start of a journey uh, that will see us interact with our patients and families in a different way, uh, work with our health service providers in different ways, try to ensure that patients get everything that, that they need most, where and when they need it. Uh, the goals have been set out in a plan uh, that will result in, in many benefits, uh, including uh, reducing our reliance on the emergency room, uh, certainly working with our partners around the table, that's a major goal for our healthcare system. Also working with uh, patients and people differently to help them better manage their chronic illnesses. Most of our visits are folks uh, who have a chronic disease. Uh, we'd like to work differently with them to try to help them stay out of our emergency room. Uh, and we're uh, having the opportunity for people to receive care uh, when they need it virtually in their own home or in the community. Certainly, uh, we are trying different pilots. Uh, we may get a chance to talk about some of those uh, this evening um, on ways in which we can bring health care back into your home uh, using uh, information technology. Certainly, computer, uh, community input will continue to play an important role as we look at how do we move forward with our uh, services, uh, how do we achieve our vision of patient-inspired health care without boundaries. Now we want to work on uh, great initiatives like this to hear from the community and an opportunity for all of you to talk to all of us your health care service partners. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. I want to again remind everybody, if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment, press star 3 on your phone to get your question into queue to be answered by our panel of health care leaders. Um, at this point, we're going to be uh, taking our questions from our callers. We're going to be taking a question from our callers, and uh, we're going to be taking a question from uh, Rosalie. And, and her question is about finding a family doctor, and I'm going to ask one of our um, panel members to uh, take on this question. Uh, is Rosalie here? Yeah. Hi, Rosalie. How are you today? Oh, pretty good, thanks. Um, and did I ask your question about um, finding a family doctor? Yeah, we just moved down here from the Aurelia area, and we're still traveling out there for uh, our health care, and um, I'd like to find a, a family physician down in this area. We're just south of Orangeville, but we're in the Caledon uh, district. Okay, so um, I think we're going to pass on the question to Liz. Hi, Rosalita. It's Liz Rudd, the CEO at Headwaters. So um, great, certainly, that you've moved to this area. Healthcare Connects is actually a number that you can call to register uh, if you need a family physician. And you can call Healthcare Connects by calling one. Do you have a pen? Hello? So you can call 1-800-445-1822, or you can visit the website, www.healthhealth.gov.on.ca, and click on Need a Doctor. A valid OHIP card is all that's really required. Healthcare Connect refers people without a regular family health care provider to physicians and nurse practitioners who are accepting new patients in their community. And I do know that in Orangeville there are do family doctors who are taking on new patients, so it should not be uh, a challenge for you to find a family doctor. Thank you so much, Liz, for your expertise on about finding a family doctor. Um, at this point, I want to bring on another caller. Um, Marcia is with us. And um, she wants to talk about hospice services. So we're going to bring her on air. Hello, Marcia. Welcome to uh, the telephone Hi. hall. Hi. Thanks very much. Um, I'm a new resident of Woodbridge, and I actually have hospice bond right down the street from me. Um, I know that uh, I am a retired nurse, and it concerns me 
that we're now going into a time where we have a, a larger bulge of people entering, you know, uh, advanced age. And hospice services, I think, are going to become more and more important. And I was wondering if the, you've given much thought to expansion of hospice services or the kind of services that are available uh, to the public. I, I don't know exactly what's been going on here in this particular area. Thank you. Uh, we're going to pass off this question to Scott to help us answer. Thanks. And I'll, I'll start and I'll probably pass it around, but thanks for the question, Marcia. There are a couple things going on. It certainly is an area of key interest from a planning perspective for exactly the same reasons you mentioned. We do have an active uh, palliative care network within uh, the Central West, and uh, it's housed within the Community Care Access Center, but they do planning for uh, where hospice services uh, or palliative care services should be provided, whether that's residential hospice or community uh, uh, palliative care, uh, as well as within the acute care setting. So that is something we're working on, and uh, we're in the process in this fiscal year, we'll be developing a more uh, fulsome plan, I guess, for how we need to address the growing needs uh, related to the seniors uh, aging population as well as related to cancer-related uh, care. And maybe Kathy, you want to elaborate on the yes. CCAC palliative care? Well, certainly. Right now we work with um, patients and their families to really figure out what are, is the best option for them, and then we help them to explore what are the available options within our within our geography. So um, we have options of in-home services through the Community Care Access Center. We have uh, Bethel House Hospice, which is up in, in the Caledon East area in our area. And then we also have acute care palliative care beds uh, in our, in our, with our hospital partners. So depending on the needs of the individual patient and family, we can help identify which of those options works best and then make sure people get the appropriate care and supports that they need uh, to ensure that they get the, the appropriate palliative care and appropriate pain and symptom management throughout their journey. Thank you so much. Uh, if you're just joining us, welcome to the Telephone Town Hall. If you'd like to ask a question or make a comment, press star 3 on your phone to get your question into queue to be answered by our panel of healthcare leaders. Thank you for all your calls and for joining us. Um, I'm going to now speak to um, Sheila. Sheila's on the phone with us, and uh, she has a question that she'd like to ask. ask. So, Sheila? Hi. Yes, I wanted to ask a question um, regarding the new uh, redeveloped Peel Memorial site. I'm wondering if there's going to be, um, or if there are any plans for opportunities for community uh, fitness and health education. Thank you, Mr. Perfect Question, and Matthew Anderson. Great, thank you, Sheila. Thanks so much, and uh, wonderful question. Um, and uh, this is exactly along the lines of where we want to go with the new uh, Peel Memorial uh, Center. Um, certainly, uh, so the short answer is yes. Um, there's great opportunities for uh, community fitness and health education. Uh, my longer answer is that as we look at designing the Peel Memorial Center, um, we're one of the major items that we want to have in there are large um, uh, classrooms. Uh, or at large rooms where we're able to do community fitness, uh, where we're also able to do community education. Um, as much as in my opening comments, I, I talked a little bit about uh, using uh, information technology to bring care into the home. Uh, very, very important that we also recognize there's a social aspect uh, to healthcare um, and bringing people together in a community setting uh, and working on uh, health and fitness is very, very important to us. The second part of that um, is the the focus of William Osler, um, which is also uh, in, embodied in the Peel Memorial Center, of trying to shift uh, the healthcare resources more to prevention, uh, more to health, um, and, and a little bit away from disease management, which is what we tend to do today. So that's the long answer, and going back to the short answer, yes, there's definitely going to be opportunities for community fitness and health education um, at Peel Memorial. Thanks again for the question. Thank you, Matthew. Um, I think it's now time to go over to our polling question, uh, another one. So we'd like to ask you a question. To answer each question, all you have to do is push the number on the phone that corresponds best with the options given to you. 
Kathy mentioned that the CCAC is working closely with family doctors and nurse practitioners to better coordinate health care. How important is it to you that your, you and your doctor and in-home care providers work together to provide more coordinated health care? Press 1 if you think very important, 2 for somewhat important, 3 for not important. For those of you just joining us, welcome to our discussion about how you can be better served by your local health care organizations. I would like to now take the opportunity to introduce uh, Liz Rood, she is the President and CEO of Headwater Health Care Center. Thank you, Heart Joke. I'm really excited to be here uh, with our local community health care partners this evening. It's a great opportunity for us to hear from you, our community. Headwater Health Care Center is an acute and complex continuing care community hospital located in Hornsville, and we serve the residents of the town of Caledon and Dufferin County. And you can see a full list of services on our web website if you visit us at www.headwatershealth.ca. We all want to keep our residents in their homes longer and provide that care close to home. Headwaters will never be able to provide all the services that are needed to the community. But what's important for us is that we offer as many as possible close to home and for those services that we can't access, that we work with our partners so that you get that timely service. We can provide um, a lot of those services by partnering with organizations like the ones we have here this evening. For example, we've built a partnership uh, to provide a regional cancer program, a regional orthopedics program, and mental health programs so that you can receive that care closer to home. Our recently announced redevelopment will enable us to expand these programs and services to reach and treat more patients. We have also joined forces with the Central West Community Care Access Center to provide an IV and wound clinic that provides our residents with an alternative to the emergency department. William Osler, the Central West Lynn, and the Ontario Tele Telemedicine Network have all joined together to provide telehome care to keep you healthy and at home. Just like this telephone town hall event, we will all continue to work together to put patients first and ensure that you get the best care possible as close to home as possible. Thank you, Liz. At this point, we want to bring in the callers again. If you'd like to ask a question, don't forget, all you have to do is press star 3 on your phone to get your question into queue to be answered by our panel of healthcare leaders. And at this point, we want to speak with Rajesh. Rajesh is on the line, and he would like to ask a question about ED and triage. Rajesh, you are on the air with our telephone town hall. Um, thank you. Um, I have actually two questions. Uh, first question is, how many doctors are working in the Brampton Civil Hospital in the emergency ward um, uh, during night? And okay. secondly, um, you know, there is a need for an improvement in the emergency area. Uh, for example, I've taken my dad recently to the hospital. Uh, five or six times I was asked the same question over and over. Every time there's a change in ship, they ask exactly the same questions, how it happened, what time it happened, you know, and it just keep going and I'm saying, well, you know, do something about the issues he has instead of actually, you know, just keep asking the same question. That's my concern. We need to, uh, you know, we need to have more emergency doctors in the, uh, in the hospital, especially in the during the night time. I don't know about the day time. Thank you, Dish. We're going to ask uh, your questions to our panel of um, professionals. And I'm going to pass this question off to um, Matt. Great. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks for just for calling in. You know, getting the right number of docs in our emergency room uh, is always uh, something that's on our mind in terms of how, how many we should have on any given shift. Um, we always have at least uh, double coverage, meaning that we have at the very least two docs uh, in the ER at any given time. Typically, during our peak hours, which are basically from late morning through to uh, uh, late evening, we have four or five docs, depending on the, uh, the, the time of day. Uh, we actually just uh, about two weeks ago added uh, an additional shift during our peak times, so again, in an effort to try to get our wait times down and get more coverage in there. Uh, in terms of asking the questions over uh, and again, um, I don't know the, the specific circumstances for sure, but uh, in general, there's a couple of things that drive that. Most important is you mentioned shift change. Um, all of our healthcare professionals are trained that when they're coming on to uh, take over uh, care from someone, whether it be a nurse or a doctor, 
uh, in their training. They are trained to ask those questions again. Uh, it can certainly feel a little bit irritating for, for folks from time to time if you're answering those same questions. They do chart the questions, uh, but they need to make sure that they've got the most up-to-date answer and also part of their responsibility is to make sure they've actually asked that question and have an answer for themselves. So uh, we do appreciate that that can be irritating from time to time, um, but it is part of their duty to make sure that they've got the most up-to-date information and they've asked that question. Thank you again. Thank you, Matt. Um, so we asked you a poll question, and that was, how important is it to you that your doctor and in-home care providers work together to provide more coordinated health care? And our top question, our top answer, sorry, was very important with 92% uh, of the vote, somewhat important with 6% of the vote, and not important with only 2% of the vote. Thank you for being part of our poll and tonight's telephone town hall. And we're going to continue to open up the question period to have you ask your questions um, to our panel of healthcare leaders. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, I want to remind you that you could press star three on your phone and your question will come into queue and it will be able to be answered. If we cannot answer your question tonight, you can leave a voicemail message at the end of tonight's town hall and someone will get back to you in the first 48 hours. Um, we're going to do a, a question from Jonas. And uh, Jonas is asking about Peel, sorry, Elizabeth, sorry. My, my, my apologies, we're going to be talking to Elizabeth, and she um, would like to ask about um, hospital services and, and costs. So we'd like to post that question to Scott. Hello, Elizabeth. Uh, hello, yes. Hi, how are you today? Oh, I'm fine. Um, this is very interesting. Uh, I, the question, it's not so much a question as a suggestion, that um, what I would like to see is a rundown of health care expenses when I, every time I go to a doctor, what is it costing the health care system? Uh, how much does a, a day in the hospital, how much is being paid out to the hospital for these services, and what services are involved. Also, for all the lab tests and the x-rays and, and uh, all these different things that we just take for granted. I think there would be a lot more respect for the healthcare system if people appreciated how much was being spent for Okay. It. Thank you, Elizabeth, for your question. We're going to uh, bring that question to Scott about uh, the different services that are provided. Thank you, Elizabeth, for the call. Um, in, in short, we know what the, uh, the hospitals receive from uh, the Ministry of Health. And in, in our Lynn area, about uh, 600 million or so go to the, the hospital, the two hospital corporations, three hospital sites, um, and there's a, um, a, a cost per day for that. Um, I think the other point that you were making that is, is interesting, and other provinces have, tr have tried this, is actually not, not billing patients, but letting them know what the cost of their stay was, so that, as you say, they don't take it for granted, and that actually is something that is worth uh, worth considering because um, I think people do assume everything is free and it isn't. Uh, so that, that's a good question. Thanks so much, Scott, for that. Uh, we're going to go to the next caller, um, and the caller's name is Susan, and she'd like to know about better communication between doctors and the CCAC. Um, Susan, you yes. are with. Yes. Good evening. Um, Good evening. Yes, my concern is with CCAC. Um, unfortunately, I've been on and off service for almost 13 years. And obviously, I've seen a great change in the service in 13 years, and it hasn't been for the better. Now, thankfully, I'm off service right now, but my issue is now with my parents. My, my mother uh, had need for physiotherapy, and now my father has had need for it and like I'm like a pit bull as an advocate because I know how to navigate the system because you know the rosy picture that you paint about working very closely with the doctors 
is all well in theory, but reality, that does not work. And I have yet to find a time where I did not have to become the advocate and actually source out the information and find out who was responsible for it and make it happen. So I'm very disturbed at the decline in the service in 13 years. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, thanks so much for your question, Susan. And I think you're, you're making some excellent points. Um, there's a couple of different things that you raised. I'll, I'll talk first about uh, the government's recently announced investment in in-home physiotherapy services, because you're right. There are wait lists uh, across the province for physiotherapy services through the PCACs, and the government has recently invested $33 million uh, in in-home physiotherapy services. It's just in this recent budget that we're uh, waiting to get passed. And that money will go towards eliminating all wait lists for in-home physiotherapy services and providing services for up to uh, 60,000 additional clients within the community setting. So that's good news from a waiting for physiotherapy perspective. The other really important point you made, Susan, is the issue of communication between the CCAC and family doctors, the whole primary care system. And that's really the core of the new Health Links initiative. We know that in the current health system, we don't always have great communication between our primary care providers and our home care providers or our hospital system. And when that doesn't happen, just as you said, sometimes the patient can get um, lost in that shuffle. And for people who have very high needs, and need a lot of care and a lot of care coordination, it's really important that we tighten up that communication between family doctors, community care services, hospitals, and all the other providers out there. So that's going to be a big part of the new Health Links initiative. We're going to be targeting better communications between primary care and the other partners within the system for those people who need care the most. Thank you, Kathy, um, for that answer. Um, our final speaker this evening is Jeanette Smith. She is the Commissioner of Health Services for the Peel Region. Her brief remarks will focus on the services provided to Peel residents by the Regional Municipality of Peel. These services range from emergency services to healthy living and disease prevention support. Following Jeanette's remarks, we're also going to be going to another poll. Thank you, Harjo, and good evening, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here on behalf of the Regional Field Health Services Department. Our services and programs are here for residents living in Branson, Mississauga, and Caledon. Our five long-term care homes provide care to older adults who can no longer live independently in the community. Our community support services, such as adult-based services for older adults, help to maintain their independence and give their caregivers some relief. Access to our homes and the community support services is coordinated by our partner, the Community Care Access Center. Paramedic services, which is the land ambulance program, respond to 911 calls and should be called when you have an emergency or an urgent health matter that cannot wait to be treated by your doctor or a local health clinic. And finally, Peel Public Health protects and promotes the health of all Peel residents. A snapshot of these services includes prenatal, postnatal, and parenting support, healthy sexuality clinics, dental services for low-income children, vaccination programs, and we recently launched Changing Course, our new initiative to create healthy environments for healthier living to prevent childhood obesity, diabetes, and other chronic diseases. For more information about any of our programs, please call Peel Health at 905 791-7800 or visit our website by going to www.peelregion.ca. Thanks. Thank you, Jeanette. Thank you for your calls and for all those who are calling in right now. If you are just joining us, welcome to our discussion about how you can be better served by our local health care system. During this discussion, uh, we're also going to be speaking about, um, uh, we're also going to be asking you questions about um, and polling you about what you think about the healthcare system. Um, the next poll we'd like to ask you. Um, to answer this question, it's very easy. Just push the number on the phone that corresponds best with the options given to you. So the polling question is, if you are feeling unwell, 
How do you first access health care in our community? Press 1 if it's the family doctor, 2 for a walk-in clinic, 3 the hospital's emergency department, 4 by calling telehealth, and 5 the urgent care center. If you'd like to ask a question to our panel of healthcare leaders, you can press star 3 on your phone and your question will come into queue. And right now we're going to be going to our next question. Um, our caller right now is Hilda and she would like to ask a question about transportation. And she is from Orangeville. Hello, Hilda. Hello there. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> We're waiting so long. I lost my voice. I um, I would be interested how you get to special appointments um, that are not within the city. When you live outside the city, what is available in affordable transportation from the country to the hospitals or to the specialists? Thank you so much for your question, Hilda. And I'll be uh, putting that question towards Liz. Okay. Great. Thanks, Hilda, so much for your question. It's one that certainly we get asked an awful lot. So we recognize that transportation is an issue in our area. Um, we know that also Headwaters Community in Action, which is a group that's come together, uh, is looking at this very issue of uh, rural transportation. And so they're looking at developing specific recommendations for improvement in this area. Currently, to get to and from appointments, there are a number of volunteer groups um, and community groups and service clubs. Uh, that do offer to pick you up and um, certainly take you to appointments. Uh, I don't have certainly the contact numbers for that, but I'm happy to give you my number. And if you call my office, I'll ensure that um, you get a response. So 519-941-2702, extension 2200. I don't know, Scott, if you had any other comments from the Lynn. Sure. <clears throat> it's Scott from uh, Central West Lynn. Um, transportation is an issue that um, we hear about all the time, particularly as you get uh, in more rural. Uh, and it's not typically something that health sector funds. Uh, in Central West, we've made um, quite substantial investments in, uh, in all areas of the land around transportation. But Dufferin County is still an area that I think is the need for more. We had a study done last fall. Um, and uh, depending on budget approvals, there, there is the hope for further investment in transportation in, in the Dufferin County area specifically. Thank you so much, Scott and Liz, for your answer. <clears throat> We're going to go to the next question, and it's with Dorothy, and she has a question about employment in health care. Hi, Dorothy, you're here with the Telephone Town Hall. Hi. Hello. Hello. Hi, good Hello. evening. You're on. Hello, yes. You're, yes. you're with us on the telephone town hall? Yes, of course. Uh, I have a question with regards to the, 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 the tab ratio to the residents in the long term care. How do we plan and I do plan on fixing that? You have a, a ratio of 26, 28 residents to one um, staff. How much? You don't have enough time to really spend with these seniors. It's just a rush and go thing. Well, do you plan on fixing that? Hi. Hi, Dorothy. It's uh, Jeanette calling from the Region Appeal. I can only actually, we'll be able to speak on our five long-term care homes, and there are quite a few other homes run by other people in the region. Um, certainly, for especially for the personal support workers that work in long-term care, it is a heavy-duty job being there for the residents, and people come into work wanting to do their absolute best. Um, one of the things we have done is, over the years, added some additional staff. We have also um, have a very strong volunteer program so that they can be into the homes to do some of the visiting and hand-holding that is so important to our residents. If there are any job openings at the Region of Peel, if you go to our website at www.peelregion.ca, up in the top right-hand corner it says um, Careers and Jobs, and you can go on if we have any openings. I know recently we've done some expansion with the help from our local health integration network and thought that we've been hiring for adult day services um, for seniors in the community that are coming into our homes during the day. So I, I wish you all the best. It's obviously you really care about the people you're uh, working with, 
and uh, keep up the great work. Thanks so much, Jeanette. We're going to go to our the results of our most recent poll. The question was, if you are feeling unwell, how do you first access health care in our community? So our top answer with 63% is the family doctor, 22% the walk-in clinic, 6% at the ER, 6% is also telehealth, 2% the urgent care center, and I'm glad that no one is abusing the, the 911, is the call 911. Thanks so much for being with us today at the Telephone Town Hall. We're going to go to our next question with Galinda, and he has a question between using the urgent care center versus using the emergency room. Hi, Galinda, you're with us at the Telephone Town Hall. Uh, hello. Hi, how Hi. are you tonight? I'm good. Thanks so much. You can ask your question to our panel of local health care leaders. Hi, I have a question about the urgent care in the hospital. What is the difference between urgent care and emergency in the hospital? Because a lot of people does not know, or oh, like they go to the emergency or they have a little bit of pain and uh, like not emergency but just they are sick. And uh, the people don't know, like they are thinking they are the same waiting time in urgent care and the emergency and they don't know the difference between it. Thank you so much for your question. Great question, Kalinda. And I think I'm going to direct this one over to Matt. Great. Thank you very much. And Kalinda, you, uh, you touched on it just in your question. Um, the important thing, first off, on the why do we really care about whether you go to an urgent care center or an emergency room, uh, and Kalinda mentioned it in her question, it's all about access to services. Uh, the bottom line is you can show up to an emergency room for anything, uh, but in the ER, we treat the most ill first. Uh, so if you're not that sick and you're in the ER, you could be waiting quite some time as we're taking care of the, the, the most sick patients. So in terms of directly answering your question, first and foremost, the most important thing for everyone is if you believe you are in a life-threatening situation, you don't hesitate to call 911. That is the thing that you do. You don't wonder about, should I go to this hospital or that hospital? You call 911 if you feel you're in a life-threatening situation. Outside of that, you make an assessment, as Corwinder uh, just mentioned, in terms of do you feel that you are in an emergency situation or you're in a situation that just requires uh, some uh, timely access and, and care. Oftentimes in our emergency room, we'll get people who are coming in who maybe have been sick for a couple of days, they're not really sure what's going on with them, maybe they've got a bit of a fever, um, or uh, often we also have people coming in more for a confirmation of diagnosis. They think they know what's going on, but they just want to get some confirmation. Those are the kinds of situations where going to an urgent care center is likely a better option for you, again, because then you're in line with folks who are also not that critical, uh, and you'll uh, likely be seen in a faster wait time. Uh, again, anytime, if you're in doubt, you call 911 or you come to the emergency room. But if you think that you're going in more for uh, a checkup of something that's been nagging you for a little bit, that's when you would go to an urgent care center. Thanks for the question. Thanks so much, so much Matt, for that answer. Our next call is Minnesi. Minnesi, sorry I'm saying that wrong. And she would like to ask a question about support at home following surgery. Hello, you're on the air for the Telephone Town Hall with us tonight. Hello, Minnesi? Hello? Okay, um, I believe that we cannot connect with Minnesi at the moment. Um, we'll hopefully get off her phone call. If not, well, we can answer her question on the website, or uh, if she leaves a voice note, we'll get back to her within 48 hours. The next question is with Joan, and Joan has a question about um, going to different hospitals for um, a specialist. Hi, Joan, you're on the air with us. Hello, how are you? Um, it's yeah. all right. <laughs> I've been to um, with a Muslim many times, and I've always found it very, very good. Um, I used to live in Branson. I now live in Mississauga. Um, the last time I had to call the hospital, um, I had to go to, I believe it was, uh, it was a Mississauga hospital anyway. Now, my cardiologist only works at William Osler, and he said that he would like me to go there if I have any problems. Now, can I request to go there or, or not? I mean, I understood that you go wherever there is a spare bed. Thanks so much, uh, Joan, for your question. We're going to take that question over to uh, Scott. Okay, sure. I can, I can start and, and I'll pass it to Matt as well. But mm -hmm. the, uh, 
the wind boundaries, when they were established, were intended to be permeable. In other words, uh, they weren't intended to prevent a resident who lives in a different wind from seeking care in another wind. And so in your case, you are a Brampton resident, you've moved to Mississauga. Uh, if your physician refers you to a specialist at William Osler, that's absolutely uh, fine with the system. Um, and, you know, you can also get a referral to the, the other hospital in Mississauga. Uh, but you can certainly get a referral to a cardiologist at William Osler from your uh, family physician. Yeah, I, I would just echo what Scott said, there's no problem, and, and we just need the referral. Uh, and in fact, if you've had, it sounds like you've already had some care at William Moser, it's probably wiser if you're comfortable going there. Probably wiser if you to stick with that hospital anyway. They've got your record, they've got your history, it's uh, definitely the way to go. Thanks so much for that. Um, we're on to our final poll of the evening, and now so we'd like to ask you a question. Uh, to answer this question, all you have to do is push the number on your phone that corresponds best with the options given to you. So our final question is, was this call a good use of your time? Press 1 if you think yes. Press 2 if you think no. So we're on for our final call for the evening. And we're going to be um, getting a call from Jane. And Jane is um, would like to find out about uh, care beds within her hospital. Hi, Jane, you're on the air with us for our final question for tonight's Telephone Town Hall. Yes, I was asking about palliative care. Okay. Um, my husband um, passed away about three weeks ago. He was on the waiting list to go to Bethel House. He never did get there. Three times he was to be discharged from hospital and he was not capable of coming home. I think with a population of 460 plus thousand people in Brampton alone, there needs to be more focus on palliative care. Another caller called about this as well. I, I just find that the palliative care unit at William Ulster is not dedicated all the palliative care. It's filled with medical patients as well, and the nurses cannot focus on giving holistic supportive care. So number Thank one, there aren't enough hospitals. There are Thank enough hospitals. And we're going to put that question over to Matt as we are short for time. Great, great. Thanks, Jane. Um, yes. And uh, probably we'll also um, um, ask others if they want to get in on this call as well. And you're absolutely right about palliative care. We did have a similar type of call earlier uh, earlier in our show this uh, this evening. Um, a couple of things. First is, is that we are um, focused on a major uh, palliative care program at the hospital um, and actually have recruited uh, several uh, palliative doctors just recently to, uh, to Branson Civic, which I think is going to help up our program. Uh, you also made the comment about getting into hospices, and we talked a little bit about hospice earlier. And I really think that that's the answer long term. Um, we certainly need to have the acute care beds there um, for uh, the acute palliative stage, but um, as we know and, and as we've seen with many, it's, it's much more appropriate for folks to be in hospice or at home. And the question really is, and what we're working on uh, at the hospital is, how do we make sure that our specialists are there to support the doctors and the families out in the community, out in the hospice? That's really where we'd like to go with palliative medicine. Um, maybe, maybe Kathy might want to add a few more comments to that. Yeah, I, I can't agree with Matt more. When we talk to people, we hear from the vast majority of people that they would love to uh, stay at home for as long as possible, and many, many people, their goal is to die at home. And unfortunately, sometimes um, it's the pain, it's the symptoms, and it's the lack of ability to get timely medical attention which can drive them to the emergency department or drive them into hospital. And uh, I think Matt strategy is right on the money in that the more we can get specialist physician care to support people out in the community, nurse practitioners and palliative care are also coming on board. We're hiring five new specialized nurse practitioners in palliative care at the CCAC. They're going to be available to help support people with their pain and their symptoms and allow them to have good pain management, good symptom control, and choose to uh, end their final days peacefully in the location of their choice. So my sincere condolences on your loss. Uh, I know that three weeks is, is very fresh for you, so please accept my sincere condolences on your loss. 
and um, know that we are all collaboratively dedicated to working very hard to improve palliative care services in this region because we couldn't agree with you more. Uh, it's something we desperately need more of. Thanks so much, Kathy, for that. So we're going to go to the results of our poll. So did you guys think that this is a good use of your time with this telephone town hall? And 90% of you answered yes. So thank you for being with us tonight here at the Telephone Town Hall. Our question, next question for tonight is from Mary, and she um, she has a question for us about cancer support for children. Hello. Hi, Mary. You're with us tonight for the Telephone Town Hall. Hi. Good evening. Yeah, good evening. My question is for the panel. Um, <clears throat> is there any support for children who have survived cancer in Brampton? Hi, Mary. It's Jeanette from the region. I'm going to take a crack at this one, and others may jump in. Um, what's in Brampton available to Caledon and Brampton and surrounding um, communities? There's a, a cancer support center called Wellspring Chinkuzi. It's an amazing, beautiful house in a residential neighborhood that specializes in support groups for both people that have dealt with cancer or in the midst of treatments or their family members. But I would highly recommend you give them a call. And it's, again, Wellspring Chinkuzi, and their number is 905-792-6480. Thanks so much, Jeanette, for that. And our final question for tonight is from Guy, and uh, he has a question about walk-in clinic. Hello. You are on the air with us. Okay, I try to make it brief, and it's um, in keeping in line with a lady by the name of Elizabeth Alspers. I have a friend that operates a walk-in clinic. Consequently, I visit it quite frequently. And in 90% of the time when I'm there, I see basically the same set of people, and it's always packed anyhow, that it seems to me and it's not to be insulted that um, in some cases it's taken just like a recreational place to hang out. I'm saying, would it be against the uh, ministry guideline to charge just a minimal amount, say $2 or $5, to see a doctor? Uh, that, that would be a question. Um, we're going to, we're running low on time. We've only a couple of minutes left, so I'm going to uh, put this question towards Scott. Thanks, Guy. Um, so the short answer to your question about can you charge a fee, the answer is no. Uh, the, the ministry doesn't allow that uh, under, under current policies. I think the, the bigger discussion around this is the, the initiative around primary uh, care and health links initiative, which brings together primary care specialists, the CCAC, and many other providers um, uh, together to deal with what are the most difficult to manage cases so that it doesn't become, a, as you sort of suggested, a bit of a social club. Uh, you're dealing with patients who need uh, care through the most uh, specialized group of providers uh, in, with primary care at the center. And it's a new way of bringing providers together around the needs of the individual patient. Um, I don't know whether Kathy or Matt, do you want to add I'll just say, so I'll just add that um, I think that one of the focus is around folks who are relying on urgent care or emergency room very, very frequently, um, or even walk-in clinics. Anybody who is using those sorts of services very frequently um, over a short period of time, that's where we want to start focusing on. I'm trying to understand better why do they feel they need that kind of service, uh, and perhaps we could coordinate services that get better around these folks um, so that they're not relying on the emergency room or, uh, or a walk-in clinic or urgent care center to try to help them receive their care. Uh, and lots of information out there for sure that if we get the people before they get into a crisis situation, the healthier they are, the easier the, uh, the, the service provision and, uh, and better for the system as a whole. So I think that that's probably a great path for us to head down uh, to address some of those challenges. Thanks so much. Once again, we appreciate everybody here spending their part of the evening with us. Our local health organizations will be using feedback received during this call to help inform their ongoing integration initiatives. The group plans to continue to hold more 
telephone town hall meetings in the future, and we hope that you will join them again. Tonight, over 8,000 connected with us over the course of the call. As I mentioned at the beginning of the call, the host organizations will summarize the questions frequently asked this evening and post the information on their website so that you can refer to it for more information about their services and how they work together for the community. If you have a question that you would like to leave for the host organizations, you can also stay on the line after the call and leave a voicemail message. Calls will be returned to you within 48 hours. Thank you again for joining us and have a wonderful evening.